Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Maya Kowalski? She was the topic of a documentary on Netflix titled, Take Care of Maya. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. In 2015, the Kowalski family lived in Venice, Florida. Jack Kowalski was a retired deputy fire chief, and his wife, Beata, worked as a home care nurse. Beata was an immigrant from Poland who did not have an excellent command of the English language. She was 14 years younger than Jack. The couple raised two children, a daughter named Maya and a son named Kyle. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. Over the 4th of July weekend in 2015, nine-year-old Maya had a severe asthma attack while she and her brother were playing with sparklers. Beata took Maya to be treated at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Maya said that she was experiencing a burning sensation on her legs and feet. Medical professionals were confused by the symptoms and did not know what was going on. Within a few weeks, Maya's symptoms had become worse her feet had turned inward, she could not walk, and she had lesions on her legs. Beata was understandably concerned for her daughter's well-being and shocked by the amount of pain Maya was reporting. Maya's parents took her to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida, but the clinicians there were unable to generate a diagnosis. After visiting Tampa General, Maya's parents were told that an asthma medication that Maya was taking could explain the muscle weakness. The Kowalskis were not being provided any helpful solutions to treat Maya's pain. Eventually, Beata heard about a physician named Anthony Kirkpatrick who studied a condition called Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, or CRPS. This is a mysterious medical disorder that is characterized by chronic pain, stiffness, and muscle atrophy. The disorder is exceedingly rare, but when it does occur, it is usually after an injury to a limb and primarily affects the extremities. There is no objective test available to diagnose CRPS. It is diagnosed solely based on clinical signs and symptoms. Some clinicians do not believe that CRPS exists. They believe that the symptoms may be psychosomatic. There is no cure for CRPS, but the pain can sometimes be managed. Typically, the symptoms resolve on their own within a year, but for some people with that disorder, it can take longer. Anthony recommended that Maya receive ketamine infusions to treat the CRPS symptoms. The theory is that the ketamine resets the brain so it stops giving false signals of pain to the extremities. Maya's parents agreed to this treatment. Maya was given ketamine infusions every three or four weeks over the course of a year. Health insurance did not cover this expensive treatment. It was $10,000 for every four-day session. The Kowalskis sold a rental property, and Beata worked extra shifts in order to continue Maya's treatment. They eventually took Maya to another physician who offered the same treatment at lower prices. In November of 2015, Maya's parents took her to Monterey, Mexico, for a five-day treatment where Maya was sedated and given high doses of of ketamine. Maya's condition improved dramatically, her pain decreased, the lesions healed, and her feet were no longer turned inward. Unfortunately, the improvements were not permanent. On October 6, 2016, 10-year-old Maya woke up in the middle of the night complaining of severe abdominal pain. Jack took Maya to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. When Beata was done work, she made her way to the hospital as well. Maya's parents explained to clinicians how Maya was diagnosed with CRPS, described her symptoms, and mentioned the effectiveness of ketamine. A nurse attempted to conduct an ultrasound on Maya, but Beata informed the nurse that Maya could not tolerate that test without receiving a ketamine infusion. The nurse became concerned and contacted a social worker who, after speaking with Beata, considered Beata's behavior to be a sign of neglect. The social worker reported the incident 
to the Department of Children and Families, otherwise known as DCF. The report was rejected because there was not enough evidence. However, staff at the hospital were not satisfied. They had grave concerns about Beata's behavior. For example, Beata was pushy and highly interested in Maya receiving ketamine. She even specifically recommended using 1,500 milligrams of that drug. She was aggressive toward staff who disagreed with her. She screamed at them and demanded that Maya be placed into a medically induced coma. When Beata left Maya's hospital room, Maya did not appear to be in as much pain. For example, she cried less. Beata suggested that Maya wanted to go to heaven because she was in so much pain, and Maya had not eaten for five days prior to arriving at the hospital. A second report was filed with the state the next day, but the concern this time was about overtreatment instead of neglect. It stated that Maya was not in pain, but Beata insisted that she was, and indicated that Beata was believed to have mental health issues. As all this was going on, the Kowalskis were not happy about the way Maya was being treated. On October 10, they requested that Maya be discharged from the hospital. The hospital staff refused this request and warned Jack and Beata that if they attempted to take Maya out of the hospital, they would be arrested. Both Beata and Jack were forbidden from seeing Maya in the hospital. One of the treatment providers with whom the Kowalskis interacted was a physician named Sally Smith. She worked in the hospital, but not for the hospital. She was employed by a company called Suncoast Center Incorporated, which had a contract with Florida to look out for the welfare of children. Sally came to believe that Beata had factitious disorder imposed on another, which is sometimes called Munchausen syndrome by proxy. This is a disorder where a caregiver intentionally induces, falsifies, or exaggerates manifestations of physical or mental health symptoms in a person who is under their care. Over time, Sally changed her mind about this diagnosis. She came to believe that Maya had factitious disorder imposed on self. According to Sally, it wasn't Maya's mother, Beata, who was causing the symptoms, as would be the case with factitious disorder imposed on another, rather it was Maya who was responsible. Maya remained in the hospital as the Kowalskis hired a lawyer to fight for custody. At a hearing in January of 2017, the Kowalski's attorney asked the judge if Beata could give her daughter a hug. The judge denied the request, claiming that the status of the case was uncertain. Beata was devastated by the judge's decision. After returning home from court, Beata left telling Jack that she was going to a CVS drugstore. When she returned home, she was intoxicated. The next day, the Kowalski family was supposed to attend a birthday party in the neighborhood. Beata said that she had a headache and did not want to attend. When Jack returned from the party, he noticed that the door to his son's bedroom was closed. He assumed that Beata was asleep in the room. The next morning, a relative who was visiting the Kowalski family entered the garage and found Beata. She had brought an end to her own life by hanging. Beata was 43 years old. She died 87 days after being separated from her daughter, Maya. Beata left a note where she indicated how she believed she had been treated like a criminal and how her daughter's suffering was only getting worse. After Beata's death, the judge allowed Maya to be evaluated by another physician. This physician concluded that Maya did not have factitious disorder imposed on self. Rather, she suffered from CR. P.S. Five days after her mother's death, Maya was allowed to return home. Over the next few years, Maya recovered quite a bit, but still suffered from some pain. A court order was put in place preventing Maya or her family from seeking ketamine to treat her symptoms. In October 2018, the Kowalskis filed a lawsuit against Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital and Suncoast. In 2021, Suncoast settled the case for $2.5 million. The trial for the case against the hospital is set to start in September 2023. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. After accusing Beata of having factitious disorder imposed on another, 
Sally Smith changed her mind and said that Maya had factitious disorder imposed on self. As it turns out, it seems likely that both of Sally's diagnoses were incorrect. In addition, the way the Kowalski family was treated after Sally made the diagnosis did not make any sense. If Sally was correct in her diagnosis of Maya, it would mean that Beata had not engaged in any wrongdoing. Despite this, Beata's contact with Maya was severely restricted. She was only allowed to communicate with Maya through video chat and telephone, no in-person contact. This is inconsistent with the idea that Maya had factitious disorder imposed on self. Beata was still being treated as if she had done something wrong, even though Sally concluded she had not. Sally's diagnosis carries another implication. If she was correct, it would mean that Maya did not have CRPS. The problem is that the hospital billed insurance for over $650,000 related to Maya's care. 174 of the billing entries were for CRPS. The hospital was billing for a diagnosis that they claimed Maya did not actually have. Item number two, Beata was initially accused of having factitious disorder imposed on another. The hospital staff thought that she was mentally ill and was harming her daughter. Like Beata was coaching Maya to state that she was in pain or maybe even directly causing the symptoms. This conclusion was used to keep Beata separated from her daughter. Beata was assessed by a mental health clinician who stated that she did not have factitious disorder imposed on another, but she may have had adjustment disorder due to Maya's illness and removal from the family home. Beata had no mental health history before the incident with the hospital. This brings me to item number three. Why did the staff at the hospital generate such a negative opinion of Beata? I think this incident may have been provoked by how the clinicians interpreted Beata's demeanor. She was assertive, loud, obnoxious, rude, and belligerent. She demanded that her daughter receive high doses of ketamine, and she broke the rules as far as communication with Maya. Beata advocated for her daughter, but in the least helpful way possible. At some point, the professionals may have simply become upset by Beata's behavior and judged her negatively based on her personality. This isn't fair, but it is common. Beata probably made the situation worse by being demanding and impolite. She did not appear to understand how people would perceive her and did not care about other people's feelings. I think that Beata became fixated on the idea that ketamine was the most effective treatment for Maya. She really wasn't interested in hearing what the hospital staff had to say. Maya's physician had given Beata this advice about the ketamine. Whether the advice was good or not is a separate issue. What's important is that Beata had a reason to believe that the ketamine would be helpful. She didn't make this up. This was information that came from another source. Moving to the last item, number four. Were the clinicians at the hospital justified in initially believing that Beata had factitious disorder imposed on another? Before looking at the evidence, I will provide a few of the characteristics associated with this disorder, which may be relevant to this case. 90% of individuals with factitious disorder are the biological mother of the victim. The perpetrator tends to present as overly attentive and attached to the victim. They may have extensive knowledge of medical terminology and recommend specific drugs or other treatments. They often refuse to accept a mental health diagnosis for the victim. They want a physical health diagnosis instead. They tend to visit many different physicians looking for a specific diagnosis, and the symptoms of the victim are often difficult to explain and are confusing to physicians. With this in mind, let's take a look at the evidence that the professionals were faced with in this case. Beata was forceful in giving medical advice and would not accept no for an answer. Beata was highly interested in Maya receiving high doses of ketamine. She and her husband had taken Maya to Mexico to be put in a medically induced coma. A medical professional claimed that Maya had been taken to somewhere around 30 different medical providers. Maya's symptoms were mysterious, 
Allegedly, Jack Kowalski told the police that when he was with Maya, she had no complaints of pain. However, when Maya's mother arrived home, Maya would suddenly be in pain. A physician implied that Beata fraudulently filled prescriptions using his name. Beata screamed at hospital staff, and Maya appeared to improve when her mother was not in the hospital room. When considering the observations that the clinicians made in this case, in my opinion, they were justified in initially believing that Beata had factitious disorder imposed on another. The steps the clinicians made after that did not make a lot of sense, like not changing course after they realized they were wrong. But as far as their initial determination, I think it was reasonable. Now moving to my final thoughts. In my opinion, the documentary about this case on Netflix, Take Care of Maya, is biased in favor of Beata Kowalski. Society understandably wants hospitals to prevent children from being harmed, but at the same time does not want parents to be falsely accused. The argument in this case is really about accuracy. Society wants hospitals to be accurate in these types of situations. But the problem is, this is not always realistic. In this particular case, the clinicians were faced with two highly unlikely explanations, CRPS or factitious disorder. There is no reliable or valid way to diagnose either disorder. I think the clinicians did the best they could under confusing circumstances. The answer in this case was not obvious. Clinicians who work in hospitals deal with irresponsible parents on a regular basis and are mandated to prevent harm to children. They don't have magical powers to discern who is innocent and who is guilty. Perhaps unintentionally, Beata's well-meaning but belligerent behavior antagonized the people who were trying to care for her daughter. She ended up working against her goal of defending her daughter's best interest. Those are my thoughts in the case of Maya Kowalski. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.